Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to BC309, our course on urban church planting. Yeah, welcome everybody, I see your comments in the chat. And Charles, I see your request for prayer for your father. And uh, okay, just let's remember to do that before we, or rather let's pray right now at the beginning of the class because we usually pray. So could somebody lead us in prayer and then also include uh, to pray for Charles' uh, father? Uh, Charles, I forget now what what was wrong with your dad? Um, okay. Um, all right, let's pray. Somebody could lead us in prayer and just speak healing for Charles' father as well. Could somebody lead in prayer for the class, please? Go ahead. Dear God, thank you so much for everything that you're doing in life, God. And thank you so much for another week of our lives, God. And thank you, Lord. Um, as we're about to learn you, that you fill us with your wisdom and understanding, God, that you make um, grow stronger in learning about the urban church and what you have to say to God, you lift up um, Charles' land into your hand. You said, in your hands, they shall be covered. And we declare your word over Charles' life in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray strength to his body, and he will rise up from the sick bed, and we declare by faith that he is healed, restored, and a strengthen God. Thank you so much for hearing me. Let us try to declare it right now that every uh, symptom that's causing him to be weak, Lord, you've already done it on the cross, and thank you, Lord, for hearing me. In your name, we declare it. Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. Okay. Thank you for leading us in prayer. Amen. And Lord bless Charles' dad and make him whole in Jesus' name. All right. So we uh, have been talking about uh, in urban church planning and our course on urban church planning. We've been talking about the spiritual side of things, and uh, we were just kind of laying the groundwork groundwork to uh, get into talking about uh, engaging in spiritual warfare, prayer, and intercession, and exercising spiritual authority uh, for people in the area where we are planting a church or pioneering a church or the region that we feel God has called us to now reach out to. So I'm just going to quickly review some of the things we covered last week, and then we will move forward uh, from there. Right, I'm going to share the notes, the PDF notes, and Let's go from there. All right. So praying and exercising authority for spiritual transformation. Uh, we can, you know, we don't control people's choices, but we can pray and we can make it easy for them to make a decision towards following Christ. So we did do that through prayer and spiritual warfare. And then we saw, all right, how, how do we pray for the lost? What do we see in scripture? So we can pray and ask God to give a region or a city as an inheritance. We invite the Holy Spirit to bring about conviction. We ask the Lord to draw them, pull upon their hearts so that they come to a place of repentance. God, God will grant them repentance. It's the Holy Spirit who enlightens them to open their spiritual eyes. We pray for God to send more laborers in uh, to minister, and we pray for the demonstration of signs and miracles. So these are things we can pray in the context of seeing people come to faith in Christ. And, and this is an ongoing thing. We continue to pray over that region, over that people. As, as part of our engagement, spiritual engagement, we also have to engage in warfare. But we said, okay, before you get in to start doing warfare, be established in certain truth. Number one, be established that Satan has been defeated. So we are actually walking in what Christ has already accomplished for us. We have complete authority and dominion over the enemy, and we are here to enforce what Christ has obtained for us. 
and we are protected on every side. So there can be there's there's no need for any fear against the enemy, and then uh, words uh, words are important for us. That when we speak words, um, we uh, we actually bind the enemy. Then we started talking about um, uh, exercising spiritual authority, and I think uh, if I remember now, there was a question last week from Christopher, which we didn't answer fully. Uh, and uh, so we need to get into that. Somebody raised her hand or something? Uh. Yeah, actually, that was me, Pastor. I just wanted to ask the question, so. Uh. Oh, OK, OK, yeah, great. So yeah, yeah so uh, the question that Christopher asked was, um you know we we as believers we understand what christ did on the cross right that like we said on the cross jesus crushed the head of the serpent he disarmed the enemy he um he expelled satan he passed judgment the judgment was already passed so that means Satan has been judged, condemned. He disarmed the enemy. He rendered the enemy powerless, or he defeated the enemy. So, as believers, you know, based on the Word of God, we say this is what Christ has already accomplished. But the big question is, why does it seem like the you know, the enemy is still so powerful, he's still doing things around, uh, both against believers, as well as in the world in general. You know, how do we explain that to somebody who doesn't necessarily have the same kind of understanding that we have? So that's the question we were trying to uh, explain. And then, uh, Tarun shared with us a link to a two-part sermon series uh, that we did long time ago. I mean, some time back. It's it's called Satan. You've been defeated. So you can go to our church website and search that Satan. You've been defeated. Satan is defeated. Something and part one, part two. Um, but let me just try to summarize some some thoughts on the on those lines. One is when Adam and Eve sinned. The authority they had on the earth was transferred to Satan because they willingly brought themselves in subjection to Satan. Whomever we obey, to them we become slaves, Romans 6 tells us. So they chose to obey Satan. They became slaves to Satan. Satan got the authority of this world. That's that's why, uh, you know, in the New Testament you find he's referred to as the God of this world. Uh, the prince of the power of the air. So he's referred to with those terms. Uh, or the prince of this world. Jesus calls him the prince of this world, John 12. So rightfully, authority on this planet was given to the devil. See, he's got you know control. Now Jesus came representing the human race, and he overthrew the devil. He did all this. He crushed the head of the serpent. He destroyed the enemy. And then he, but now that his victory has to become effective in the lives of people. That means people have got to be able to walk in that victory. But the condition is, just as Adam and Eve submitted themselves to the devil, people have to make the choice to come out of submission to the devil and submit themselves to Christ. So that's a choice God cannot make for people. People have to do it, each individual. But whichever individual makes the choice to come out of submission to the devil and into submission to Christ, then that individual can then begin to access what Christ has completed for us. 
So if we want to look at it like this, the Bible refers to um, Adam, first Adam, Christ, the last Adam. First Adam, first man, Christ, the second man. This is in First Corinthians chapter 15. So we are all by default in the first Adam or the first man. And in the first Adam or the first man, we automatically inherit whatever comes under him, which is subjection to sin, Satan, and death. But the last Adam, the second man, Jesus Christ, came. And so I'm starting a new race of people. Whoever wants to be a part of this race, they can, but they have to come through Christ. They have to submit themselves to Christ, through faith in Christ. So that is an individual's choice. But when we make that choice, then we come in subjection uh, to Christ. We submit ourselves to Christ, and then we, in Christ, have mastery over Satan and over all his works. So there are two things. One is we have to come in submission to Christ. And secondly, we have to walk in the revelation of what Christ has done for us. Otherwise, what happens is there are people who may come in submission to Christ, but they don't walk in the revelation. They don't receive the revelation. They don't walk in it. They will still be struggling as though they were part of the first man or first Adam. And those who don't make the transition, obviously, they'll be struggling as under the first Adam, the first man. That means the devil continues to work against them. So as far as they are concerned, the devil is still very powerful because he is still Lord and he still has control over their lives. Now when we come into Christ, when we come into the second man or the last Adam, the devil, the devil still tries to keep these people in ignorance. He still tries to deceive them. He still tries to. So that's his tactic. What is his tactic? Either keep them in ignorance or keep them in deception. So tries to keep them ignorant or tries to tell them the Bible is not really what it says. You know, so that's deception. Trying to get them away from believing the truth. And so even believers, if they are in ignorance or they are in deception, they still can't live in a place of dominion and authority over the enemy. So then you still see the struggle. So even in those cases, it seems like the devil is still very powerful, and actually he is, he is a defeated enemy. It's just that the believers don't know it, or they've been told that it's not true. So that's why the enemy still seems powerful. Uh, is that OK, Christopher? Does that explain? The, what you were looking for, uh, the question you had? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Pastor. I mean, I think um, it um, explains um, explains it. Uh, I guess what um, maybe just to sort of, I, I guess, ask a related question. When we uh, when we talk about uh, when we even refer to, say, for example, uh, uh, you know, when Peter mentioned. Um, I think in uh, verse um, verse five, I can't remember the, the actual verse, but when he talked about being sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks like a roaring lion, mm. seeking who whom he may devour. Um, does this I mean, does this still relate to you know people who are who are doing both things, submitting as well as uh, walking in in the revelation? Um, or is it more for you know people who are sort of in the middle, or uh, you know who are not who are not submitted? Um, because I mean I, I guess what I'm coming from is um, is it isn't is it not um, a, a constant um, 
in a in a sense threat uh which 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 uh, you know we live we live in um even though we have you know we have done both those two those two things that you just mentioned mm mm-hmm. i understand correct so you know so we find scriptures like what you referred to first peter 5 8 and 9 um ephesians 4 27 but the bible is telling us as believers you know we have submitted to christ and we also have the revelation so he's talking to all believers all believers we must continually be vigilant against the enemy because the enemy is going to try to get any point of entry into the life of believer so to answer your question yes all believers even after we submit to christ and even after we understand receive the understanding of christ's victory on the cross we have to stay vigilant we have to stay alert and give no place to the devil not give no access to the devil so for the entirety of our life here on earth that's how we live uh not because the devil is so great but because he is looking for opportunities to come in and trip us up and he his tactics are very simple it his tactics are to either keep somebody in ignorance or to deceive or to intimidate it's basically things related to the mind primarily trying to you know disturb believers in the area of the mind through lies and deceptions and so on okay all right so let's um pick up from where we paused last week we were talking about you know exercising authority to open prison doors so one side we are doing our praying which we must do according to the scriptures but in addition to our prayer and intercession we also need to exercise spiritual authority this authority is over the we're talking about these evil powers satan and his demons and how do we go about doing that so the first thing we were talking about last week was uh we establish god's presence through praise and worship and so through our praise through our exaltation of god it is our praise is having an effect of dethroning or of uh, destabilizing demonic powers so we saw in scripture in you know, psalm 22 or 3 it says that god is enthroned on the praises of his people so as we praise god god is enthroned we are we are, we are saying uh, we are in effect establishing his kingdom rule and his kingdom is dominion in that region as we praise and start worship god we saw from first five first samuel 5:1 to 4 and i just you know uh, described this incident where the ark of the tabernacle was taken by the philistines into the temple of their god dagon when it was placed there dagon fell on his face the statue of dagon was down on his face they put it back up and then it was broken into two and they realized this is how powerful the presence of god is the ark of the covenant was a symbol of the presence of god but it's also very um you know it's depicting something very powerful for us how the presence of god displaces the presence of demonic powers right and we establish that through our praise our worship In Psalm one forty nine verses six through nine, it's very interesting. Uh, if we read that, we learn that through our praise, we're actually binding um, the powers of darkness. You Now it talks in Psalm one forty nine. It says, "Through the high praises of God, uh, we, uh, as believers, as as God's people, we have a two edged sword in our hand." and we executing vengeance on the nations now this is obviously not literal right our praise to god is like us walking with a double edged sword and um executing vengeance on the nations so it's not literal it's like now you're not literally going around with a physical sword in your hand and 
binding up the uh, the, um, uh, the uh, kings and cha uh, in chains. No, it's the effect of our praise. It is the effect of us glorifying God. It's it's spiritually it's equivalent to this. That is, we are executing vengeance and on executing the written judgment on our spiritual adversaries. Right. So our praise to God is causing this effect on our spiritual adversaries. And in Psalm, sorry, in Isaiah 19 and verse 1, we see the effect of the presence of God. You know, it says that when God rides, Isaiah 19, 1, uh, the idols of Egypt will totter or shake at the presence of God. Right there. So, uh, wherever God's presence is, the powers of darkness shake. Right? So, that's our first step in exercising spiritual authority is we establish God's presence through praise and worship. And we, we must be confident you know, that as we are praising God, as we are worshiping God, this is the effect of our praise and worship over, over the spiritual atmosphere where we are. Uh, this is the effect of our praise and worship on our spiritual adversaries. This is what is happening. Secondly, we proclaim, we declare Christ's finished work on the cross for the salvation of souls. If you go to Isaiah 52, and um, somebody could read that, Isaiah 52, and could somebody read verse 15, please? Isaiah 52, verse 15. Somebody can read that. B 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which he had not been told them shall they see. And that which they have not heard shall they consider. Okay, thank you. Right. Look at the first part of that verse, verse 15. So shall he. Now, this is obviously talking about Christ and his work on the cross. Uh, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The word sprinkle really is referring to the sprinkling of the blood. So, you know, verse 14 talks about, you know, when Christ was crucified, his appearance was so marred and nobody could recognize him. And in that context, verse 15 is there, he will sprinkle many nations. That means, as is foretelling, that through his death, the blood of Christ will be sprinkled for and upon many nations. The sprinkling of the blood. So think about this. The blood of Christ has been sprinkled upon the nations. So when you think about your nation, or you can think about your city, or your region, or your nation. According to Isaiah 52 verse 15, Christ's blood has been sprinkled over your nation or your people, your city. He will socially sprinkle many nations. That means the blood of Christ has been made available for everybody. And what we are going to do is to enforce that. We declare that the blood of Jesus Christ has been sprinkled, has been made available for the city, or the region that we are people in the city or people in the region that we are praying for and we want the blood of christ to veil in their lives we say we announce to satan satan christ has already shed his blood for the people in my city for the people in this region the people in this nation and so we are declaring that salvation is being made available for them we are declaring that uh, forgiveness of sins has been made available for them. 
and you know we we it's not that we are making a decision for them we can't do that they have to be make the decision but we are saying we are here to enforce the power of the shed blood of Christ for them in order for their them to be receive forgiveness of sins you know, for order for them to experience their redemption in order for them to experience every provision that comes through the cross of Christ okay. so we are announcing we know that the blood of Christ has been sprinkled for these people. It's like saying the prison doors have been opened. Of course, the prison has to come out, but the prison doors have been opened. We're announcing the doors are open and people can be released. The third aspect of our spiritual warfare, so one is we're making that proclamation on the basis of Christ's finished work on the cross. Thirdly, we take authority over what the powers of darkness are doing in that region. And so we deal with those things. Now again, we use our words in the authority of Jesus' name. Right? So we can, as we are declaring, we dislodge those strongholds in the minds of people. So whatever we find, you know, we can deal with that and say we take authority over these things in the minds of people. Uh, we take authority over these thoughts, these arguments, these reasonings, uh, and we pull it down. Right? The basis for that, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's go there. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 through 6. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4, let's read verse 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. Somebody can read that for us, please. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Amen. Mm. So. Paul is telling us that we are engaged in spiritual warfare. So we are not fighting in the flesh. That's verse 3. He's telling us, verse 4, that we are using spiritual weapons, weapons that are mighty through God. That means these are very powerful weapons. And then he tells us, what are we doing with these weapons? And you'll find here that the context is things in the mind. Because he's talking about arguments. He's talking about reasonings that go against the knowledge of God. He's talking about every thought. So he's talking about arguments, reasonings, or imaginations. And he's talking about thought. And in that context, he also uses the word strongholds, verse 4. So the word strongholds of verse 4 has to be interpreted in the context of arguments, reasonings, and thought in verse 5. Okay, so what do we do with the weapons that God has given to us, the spiritual weapons? Well, we are dealing with things in the minds of people. So... Uh, we're not talking about air castles, you know, castles in the air or somewhere in the atmosphere. No, we're dealing with things that the enemy has done in the minds of people um, in order to prevent them from making a decision for Christ. And he says, the weapons God has given to us will pull these things down so that their minds can be clear to receive the light of the gospel of Christ. Right? So that's what we do. So we, how do we exercise our authority? By the words we speak. So in the name of Jesus, if we speak those words that's, that announce the pulling down of strongholds, the casting down of arguments, the, uh, the casting down of reasonings and imaginations, they're taking every thought captive 
So we announce that in the name of Jesus. And it's basically tearing down Satan's blindness so that when the gospel is proclaimed, or when the gospel is brought to these people, they will be able to receive it. Right? So that also has to happen, and we will talk about that. Okay. The fourth way we exercise spiritual authority is to destroy the works of evil spirits um, that are specifically in at at work. Right? So these are things that are happening behind. Um, uh, activities that are prevalent among the people. So whatever we see, you know, so you may identify exams, giving examples here. You may identify prostitution or corruption or murder or etc. Other things, activities that are happening, but those activities are demonically energized. There are spirits of disobedience that are causing those acts of disobedience. So we deal with those demonic spirits. We bind or we disallow their activity in the name of Jesus Christ okay so uh, yeah four of these so here are four ways by which we exercise spiritual authority one is just praising and worshiping God two is announcing that the blood has been sprinkled for every nation three is we through our words and exercise of spiritual authority we pull down What's going on in the minds of people, and fourth, through the exercise of our authority, we deal with what evil spirits are doing amongst the people, and which is visible through the activities that is prevalent, uh, the wrong activities that is prevalent among the people. Okay, so there is prayer based on the word of God, and there is the exercise of spiritual authority, all engaged, all in order to affect the spiritual environment so that people can then hear the gospel and make a decision to follow Christ, to encounter Jesus Christ. So while that is going on, we need to continue the proclamation of the gospel. Right? So before we get into the next chapter, let me pause and see if there are any questions. Any questions so far? Everybody's with me. Okay. All right, Christopher, please go ahead. Yeah, because we can ask you a question. Yes, uh, Pastor, uh, to your point um, with regards to um, addressing um, uh, Satan's influence in cities, um, I just, just uh, I guess, a, a, a sort of a high level question around um, the, the uh, predominance of uh, other religions in, um, in cities. Um, would you say that, you know, from, from the early uh, uh, Early days of of Christianity, where there were uh, other religions um, or other ways of practicing religion, uh, to to where uh, Christianity sort of you know fits in, um, in in percentages you know to other religions. Um, would you say that uh, those I mean the the predominance of those religions are really the work of of Satan and um, uh, you know, in relation to uh, why uh, Christianity is um, relatively low in 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 a lot of in, in a lot of countries. I'm not sure if I clearly sort of uh, explain mm. that. Yeah. So I'll just point us to First uh, Timothy chapter four, verse one. First Timothy chapter four, verse one. But the Bible talks about. Um, deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So that means there are spirits, demonic powers, that deceive and that teach 
there are doctrines of demons or teachings, philosophies, ideas, ideologies. So there is deception and there is doctrine. And both of these doctrine, and I'm saying they're not talk, talking about the doctrine of the, the word of God, but other kinds of doctrine, which are demonically energized. So the answer to your question is yes. That in regions where you know you, you find all kinds of maybe religions, uh, it could be even practices, you know, right from animism to all kinds of things, you know, that are prevalent among maybe a culture, a group, a community, a village, a town, a city, a nation. What do we know? Well, deception and doctrines, demonically energized. So while that is prevalent and maybe deep-seated, the powers behind it are demonic. So then the question is, is there ever a possibility that this can be dislodged at such a wide scale? The answer to that question is yes, because we do find in Scripture, and I'm just looking at um, Acts chapter 16 and also Acts chapter 19, both these as examples. And in Acts chapter 16, it's a city called Philippi. In Acts chapter 19, it's a city called Phygius, where to a large extent, what happened was, at that time, at that time, in Philippi, the people were controlled by a demonic expression through a woman who was a fortune teller. In Ephesus, the people were controlled by a goddess, Diana. And in both these, so I'm just giving an example, but there was a dominating, prevailing thought or doctrine or if you want to say religion or influence in these cities but when the gospel came that was dislodged right? so is it possible for something like that to happen again today answer is yes is it possible for communities or cities or maybe even nations to be transformed the answer is yes and um, we the church must journey into it you know we the church must pray into it exercise authority towards it and then what we're going to look in chapter 19 which is proclaim the gospel so there is prayer there's exercise of authority and then there's a proclamation of the gospel all three should happen in order to see a tra spiritual transformation Good. Any other question? Questions? Sorry. Okay. So let's move forward now. We'll start off the next chapter, chapter 19. So part of our, uh, sorry, Kennedy. Kennedy, please go ahead with your question. Hello, am I audible? Yes, Kennedy, we can hear you. I thank God I'm in bed, I'm sick, but I'm listening. Okay. What I was just yeah, what I was inquiring, how do you deal with these traders who engage in uh, black magic? Like we go to a shop, we get things are hanged, but you have to buy something from them. How do you deal with that or how do you handle that? Okay, okay. Um, so the question is, how do we deal with, you know, in this case, black magic, people who practice black magic and so on? So I think, you know, if you look, if you want to look, start off with a biblical example, one would be uh, Acts chapter 8. Uh, another example would be Acts chapter 13. And a third example would be Acts 19, which we referenced a little earlier. 
in, uh, and I'll just mention these things and then you know we will see how, how to apply that today. Acts chapter 8, we see Philip go into the city of Samaria. And at that time, the entire city, now of course the cities in Bible times were much smaller than cities of today. But the city of Samaria at that time was under the influence of a person who practiced black magic or sorcery. And his name, and his name was Simon the Sorcerer. And all the people were following him because he had he gained control of them through his black magic, through his sorcery, through his practice of witchcraft and so on. And in a situation like that, here comes Philip, who was not an apostle, he was just a believer. We would call him as a volunteer. You know, comes Philip, but he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he proclaims Christ to them. And signs, wonders and miracles begin to happen. And then this Simon the sorcerer, he realizes that the Christ whom Philip is preaching is more powerful than him. And so he believes, he's baptized, he becomes a believer. And so people are also, you know, uh, brought out of Simon's control. Of course, Simon had a misunderstanding in the sense that he thought, you know, and when he saw Peter and John come in and they were praying for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he thought he could get that power by money, you know, and that was this misunderstanding. He was corrected for it, he was rebuked for it. But the point is, in this case, there was a proclamation of the gospel with power, and it saw the transformation of, a, of the city of Samaria that was previously under the control of somebody who practiced witchcraft. Then you look at Acts 13. Uh, Acts 13. When Paul and Barnabas, they come to the island of Paphos, over there again, they find another person. They find a person who practice, was practicing witchcraft. And he was controlling the governor of that place. So the governor was a very spiritual man, but he was being controlled by Bar Jesus, who was a sorcerer, a practicer of black magic and witchcraft. And Paul and Barnabas come in, they are sharing the gospel with the governor, Sergius Paulus. He's convinced, or like he, he's really interested, but this person is practicing black, you know, witchcraft is interfering, and there, Paul, you know, you know, rebukes him and declares blindness on him for a season. So the power of God is demonstrated. Acts nineteen. Ephesus is under the control of the goddess Diana. And it says in Acts 19.11, through the hands of the Apostle Paul, unusual miracles were taking place. So there was a demonstration of the power of God. And some people, you know, try to imitate Paul, the seven sons of Sceva. They try to cast out demons. But that didn't work. But what happened? What was the effect? The people in the city of Ephesus who were under the control of this goddess Diana, they and they were all practicing black magic. When they saw the authority of Jesus' name and how powerful it was, it says they took all their um, things, you know, artifacts that they used as part of their black magic, and they went and they burned it. So the common thread in all three incidents that we see in the book of Acts is the demonstration of the power of God, all three, which brought people out of the control of witchcraft or black magic, caused them to discard these items and things they were using and turn to Christ. So in a situation, like that today, in, in today's expression may be a little different, where there will be people who are practicing black magic. So our, our, our objective as a church is to keep demonstrating the power of God, keep demonstrating the power of God, so that people will experience God's working, and it will show them that the power of God, the power of the name of Jesus, is far superior to witchcraft, to black magic 
and cause them to turn to Christ. So that would be the response. Uh, that's, that would be our approach uh, towards those things. You know, we need to demonstrate the power of Christ being greater uh, than those things. Is that okay, Kenneth? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, welcome, Kennedy. So, the next. Okay. I was just going to start next. And, okay, Abraham, I see a question here. The Church of God here in Vietnam have convinced many people to believe in God, the Mother, using the Bible. Hmm. Okay. Um, Abraham, I'm not very familiar with this. Could you explain it a bit for us, please? Yes, Pastor. Pastor, please, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, the, there is a church called the Church of God. And I think they, they believe in Christ. I'm so humble. They said, I think he's a new name that we all have to believe in him. So I meet so many people, I've met almost about four people who are trying to convince me that I have to believe in God the Mother, the Father, and then Christ Amsterdam before I can receive salvation. And they try to use the New Jerusalem as the as the cross, so that that is our, our mother, that's in, in Galatians 4. So when you meet these people, they try to use their understanding to explain the scripture. And it's the same Bible that they are using, but just that they are misinterpreting it. So, how do you deal with this before? Is it from the spiritual realm or through Bible studies and discussion? Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, Abraham, I am not too familiar with this particular movement that, you know, or this, this particular group of people that you're referring to. But I understand what you're saying. I understand that these people are using New Jerusalem, based on what they read in Galatians 4, uh, as God the Mother. And they're trying to get people to believe. Or they're saying you have to believe in God the Father, God the Mother, and in Christ, is it? And in Christ. Okay. So I, I don't know everything about this particular group you're referring to, but definitely that's not you know what the Bible is teaching us. Um, uh, at, you know, First John chapter five clearly says there are three that bear witness in heaven. You know. Father, the Spirit, and the Word. So it's very clear. First John five seven, I think it is. Um, First John chapter five. Uh, yeah. Um, First John five verses six, seven, and eight. Hmm? But verse seven says there are three that bear witness in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one. So there's no mention of mother and all of that, right? Um, so this whole idea of the mother is is foreign to Scripture. Uh, now, you see, when we talk about cults, so I would, I would, I don't know everything about this group, but from what you have shared. I would classify them as a cult. I know it's a little early for me to make that kind of a judgment, but let's say they are a cult. I don't know all the details. But let's say they are a cult. That means they are they are believing something that's not true. They are in error. How do we deal with them? And and the same thing, you know, whether you're dealing with Jehovah's Witness or Mormons or uh, the Latter Day Saints or you know all these 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 so many things. Um, if see the thing is this among all these groups there are people who are very uh, forceful in their belief that means they are going to argue they're going to fight so i would say don't waste time with them just leave them alone 
and stay away from them. No point investing your time and energy with them. What we must do is take care of the people God has entrusted to us by teaching them the truth. You know, teach them the word. This is what the Bible says. I establish the, them the truth so that when they are exposed to these other groups, they can stand their ground. They know what is the truth so that when they hear something that's different from the truth, they can say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not convinced about that because I'm established in the truth. That's the first thing. Secondly, if there are people from those groups who are genuinely interested, that means they're willing to listen, they're willing to seek for answers, then of course you can point to them and say, hey, nowhere in the Bible do you find us being called to worship God the Mother. It's nowhere there. Uh, it's very clear, you know, First uh, John 5, if you starting from Genesis chapter 1, you know, you could say, you can see God the Father, you can see God the Spirit at work. First John 5, 7, there is three that wit bear witness, Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Nowhere is there this thing about Mother, right? Uh, Jerusalem is referred to that as a, as a city of God. As, you know, and it's referred to many many terms so um, but it's not a place not something that we worship or it's not in the place of God so if they are willing to listen then you have that kind of conversation otherwise just focus on taking care of the people God has given you and establish them in the truth right so the reference I would I would point us to is in Acts chapter 20 where uh, uh, Paul you know he 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 in Acts 20 Verses 29 to 32, uh, he tells, and I, or let me put it like this Acts 20, 28 to 32. Acts, let me write this for you. Acts 20, 28 to 32. Yeah. Let us refer you to this passage where Paul is telling the Ephesian leaders look, you know, you are, you are a shepherd of these people, but there's going to be savage wolves who are going to come in. That means people are coming in with these wrong ideas and wrong. They're going to speak all kinds of things. But then he says in verse 32, I'm commending you to the word of God. You know, so he says, You're a spiritual leader. You're going to face these problems with all these wrong ideas and doctrines. What's the antidote? Be established in the word of God. Okay. All right, Kennedy, do you have a question um, or do you want to bring it up tomorrow? I have uh, a question. Okay, go ahead. Let's see if we can do it today, others. How do you handle the spirits of Mormon? Mormon spirits. Where you are told people work, they work, and it's like they work till they obey money, they start. They, they work to the extent that it becomes a Mormon, a Mormon spirit where they just look for money, 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 money in the society. Mm. Because we are told in the Bible, unless you work, you won't eat. Mm, 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 mm. So you could, yeah, so a, a quick answer to your question is, the way, we, the way we counteract something is by demonstrating the opposite attitude or discipline. So example, if there is greed, we demonstrate generosity. Right? So as believers, we demonstrate the opposite. Why? The Bible says, overcome evil with good. Right. So to counteract evil, what do we do? We do the good. We do the exact opposite. So we demonstrate the opposite, the good attitude, or the good discipline, in, in order to overthrow uh, the evil. So in this case, when, when we say the love of mammon, how do we overthrow that? We overthrow it by demonstrating uh, just an overflow of love for God. So the more the church comes in, church means believers as people, we demonstrate more of that love of God, that un, you know, unrestrained love for God, then people who are caught up and trapped by the love of mammon, they're going to be challenged. And the power over their lives will be dislocated because the church is demonstrating something superior. We overcome evil with good. So that's just a you know a general answer that you can apply to many situations. Is that okay, Kennedy? Thank you, thank you. All right. So good questions. Interesting. We will 
uh, we'll continue this tomorrow, um, build on this, what we've been talking about. Uh, let's take a moment to pray and then we will dismiss, please. Can somebody pray with us? Okay, I'll pray, sir. Go ahead, Mangi. Heavenly Father, we, we know that you have overcome all things, Lord. You overcome death, you overcome sin, you overcome Satan himself, Lord. He has no mm. power, and we have victory in you, Lord. Even though we live in the world that's full of uh, hatred, full of uh, envy, sin, and other things that do not align with your word, Lord. We pray, Father, to continue to empower us, Lord. You continue to show us your love, Lord, so that we can reflect this love to the world. And we thank you for this time, Lord, and we thank you for the wisdom that you've uh, placed in fast Ashish. We pray as we continue to learn, Lord, let your Holy Spirit teach us more and keep us in your will, Lord. Until we meet again, Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mangi. Thank you, everyone. God bless you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll meet again tomorrow. Bye now.